Hello, thanks a lot for joining us for the October virtual seminar of AI and big data in finance. Today, we are really happy to have Eric Brynjolfsson from Stanford, who will talk about digital capital and superstar firms. And uh, our most recently tenured uh, uh, Miao Benjang, who will discuss the paper. So the speaker will have 30 minutes for the um, presentation and the discussant will have 20 minutes. And uh, then we will have 10 minutes for the Q&A with the audience. So please make sure you send us uh, your questions using the uh, Q&A option. Uh, about the middle of the talk, I, if there are many clarifying questions in the Q&A, I will uh, interrupt Eric and relay the questions to him. And he has graciously uh, uh, suggested that whenever you have clarifying questions, please definitely post them in the chat. But questions which need a longer debate will be uh, uh, discussed during the Q&A at the end. I want to also ask everybody to be mindful of your questions. Finally, once the official recorded part of the seminar is over, we hope that you can all stay and join us for a 15 minute um, informal um, uh, follow up discussion. So now, Eric, the floor is yours. Would you like to share your slides? Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Miriam. I really appreciate you all inviting me. This is a great forum you've all pulled together, a remarkable people. And thank you for uh, Miao Ben Zhang for uh, being the discussant. And as Miriam mentioned, I'm very much looking forward to um, all of you uh, uh, asking questions and, and hearing your comments on this research. Um, and I'd love to get your, your comments and suggestions on it. So let me go ahead and uh, share the slides now. So you can see the first slide, I hope. Um, so uh, this paper is on digital capital and superstar firms. It's with uh, Sunny Tambe, uh, Lauren Hitt, and Daniel Rock. And it builds on a long tradition of, of research that uh, uh, many of us have been doing for, for some time on this, but we have some new data and some new methods that I think move it forward a bit. Let me start with a, a bit of background, which is uh, that IT is a general purpose technology, especially artificial intelligence. Uh, it has these three characteristics that Tim Bresnahan and Manuel Trachtenberg uh, uh, underscored for general purpose technologies. They're pervasive. They can be improved over time and they're able to spawn complementary innovations. And uh, that's certainly very true for uh, uh, AI and IT. These uh, class, these these key capabilities are very widespread. Um, they're rapidly improving. And I think most importantly, and what we'll stress in this paper is they spawn these complementary innovations, not just new innovations in, in, that are technological uh, in hardware and software, but as we'll see more importantly, innovations in business processes and business models and, and organizational capital. Those can be harder to measure, but ultimately they're uh, significantly bigger and more important, whether you measure them by the cost or the, the revenue side. They also take significant time to implement. You could even argue that uh, AI is the most general of all general purpose technologies. Here's, uh, here's my friend Demis Hassabis, who, uh, who's the CEO of a company called DeepMind, Google's DeepMind division. And um, he has this modest goal on his, the wall in his uh, office in London. It says, our goal is to solve intelligence and then use that to solve all the other problems in the world. So uh, something to, to shoot for in your own, uh, in your own life goals. Um, digital capital um, is the intangible assets that are associated with computerization. And IT hardware is really only about 10% of the investment in a typical large system, even IT hardware and software put together. For instance, in research that you know um, I did with uh, David Fatusi and Lauren Hitt and, and in other research I did with Adam Saunders, uh, we found a consistent pattern that these systems have about 10 times as much investment in business process redesign. So for instance, a large ERP or enterprise resource planning system might cost $10 million for the hardware and software, but that companies typically spend on the order of $100 million on consultants from places like Accenture or their own teams, um, human capital investments and managerial time to re-engineer and reinvent business processes. And, and this ratio is, is very common on the cost side. 
And as we'll see, it also shows up on the revenue side. So in some ways, this digital capital, these intangible assets are similar to uh, other kinds of capital. Um, they're costly to create. You have to put time and effort into creating them. And then you get benefits from them over a period of time. The payoff doesn't happen instantaneously, but may happen over three or five or 10 years. So very much like other kinds of assets, except that they are intangible. So when, when say Dell builds, you know, if they want to double their capacity by building a second factory made out of bricks and mortar, that's very visible to all of us. And it will typically show up on their balance sheet. But if they double the capacity of an existing factory by re-engineering the business processes and using new technologies, it's likely that that will not show up on the balance sheet. Uh, there'll be more output and maybe some cost in creating that, um, but most accountants won't allow them to, to count those business processes as new kinds of capital. And so that creates a, an asymmetry in terms of what we see in a lot of the, the accounting numbers. The productivity effects can be quite important. Um, as I mentioned, GPTs require this complementary investments, particularly in intangible capital. And if you look at total factor productivity, we see that these, this increase in capital stock may or may not be measured. If we don't measure it well, because intangible measurement is very difficult, then we're going to be missing the contribution to the capital stock and we're gonna be missing that portion of output. So we're going to mismeasure TFP both on the input and the output side. So there are a number of open questions. Um, are the high values that have been seen due mainly to high prices for digital capital, or these intangibles or high quantities? If it's high prices, then they may not be very sustainable. There may be some quasi rents in place that um, could disappear pretty quickly. But if they're high quantities, they're real actual increases in the amount of digital capital, then they're much more likely to have a long run economic impact. Um, we also are interested in knowing which kinds of firms are creating most of the digital capital. Um, and as we'll see there, it's been quite asymmetric in terms of who's doing that. And then we want to map that onto productivity and growth, as I suggested, and measure that uh, econometrically. So let me quickly preview the results uh, so you don't lose those. We'll, we'll come back to them, but, but this is what we'll, I'll be showing you. Uh, we found that the market value of digital capital rose very sharply in the late 1990s, uh, you know, culminating in the dot-com boom. And then it fell um, in the early 2000s uh, down to the Great Recession. And since then, it's been rising again. And we can map it to specific innovations in big data and data science. And most recently, it's most correlated with innovations in AI. These fluctuations that we see going up and down have mostly been due to increases in digital quantity and decreases in digital quantity rather than just prices. Around the dot-com boom in the year 2000, there was a lot of a price of effect, but the other periods, it was more of a quantity effect. So we, we, I'll show you how we separate out those two components. It's not been at all even. The top 10% of firms account for the majority of digital capital and the top 80% of firms, sorry, the top 20% of firms account for almost all of the digital capital while the bottom 80% have hardly invested at all since the, the turn of the century. So rather than this being uh, you know, widely diffused, we're seeing more and more concentration of the skills and the assets in these uh, relatively small group of firms. Um, we also see that it's correlated with its particular changes in skills. Uh, originally, it was mostly network administrators, then web designers, and database engineers. And finally, uh, data science and AI experts are the ones that have been associated with the biggest and most recent boom in digital capital or intangible assets. And we can pick this out, as I'll show you from data we have uh, on, on fine-grained resumes. And finally, um, when we look at how the digital capital is associated with productivity growth by looking at production functions and productivity equations, uh, we find that uh, it's actually a pretty strong predictor of productivity growth during most of the period um, but the very latest period, we don't see yet a productivity increase. Um, our interpretation, we don't know for sure whether the latest increase in digital capital is, is a bit of a bubble, or I think more likely it's part of what uh, Daniel Rock and, and Chad Severson and I call the productivity J curve, which is that it takes time before assets, digital assets get converted into productivity gains. And we may still be in the early stages for the latest wave. And, uh, and actually, I, I would predict that in the coming years, 
we'll start harvesting some of those assets and get some benefits. So let me explain how we go about measuring these things and get to those conclusions that I just showed you. Um, uh, the theory predicts that you can measure intangible capital and measure the quantities under uh, a set of somewhat restrictive assumptions that if you have competitive product markets, constant returns to scale and immediate factor adjustment, you can directly measure it. But you can um, measure it um, using intangible values in IT investment series um, in some work that I did with Xing Qiu Yang and, and Lauren Hitt, uh, I guess almost 20 years ago now. And uh, we're gonna be using that technique. And this is works even, or especially when there are adjustment costs, you get the observed value of intangible capital um, that tells you basically what the price times quantity of intangible capital is. And then you can separate out the price versus the quantity by looking at the adjustment cost schedule. And the adjustment cost schedule tells you that when the price is significantly above one, then you're going to want to invest more. And since you don't invest instantaneously, aren't able to instantaneously make those investments, um, the speed of adjustment is going to be proportional to how far the price is above one. And uh, so the so-called Q theory of investment, um, this will generate two equations and two unknowns, and then you can recursively compute the prices and the quantities. Bob Hall really developed uh, most of this theory and we're gonna be drawing on that. And then we're gonna extend it to firm level data, which, which hasn't been done previously. Uh, in the past, it was done at some aggregate level in very coarse terms, but we are now able to get much more fine grained data and therefore make these distinctions about different firms and also just frankly, much more um, uh, precise measurement. Um, the first equation that we're gonna be using is to estimate the market value of the firm as a function of all the assets. So in theory, when you buy a firm, what are you buying? You're buying the non-human assets. You can't own the people, but you can own the non-human assets. And that includes property, plants, and equipment, it includes other assets like cash and receivables, uh, uh, loan, uh, money that you have coming towards it. Um, you can separate out different categories of assets like IT and measure, and measure them separately. Now, if uh, in the simplest model where there's zero adjustment costs and there was no other, no synergies and no intangibles, then the market value would just be the sum of all those assets. That's what you're buying after all. Uh, in practice, the market value may differ from the sum of those. And that's where these beta coefficients come in. Um, so instead of the betas all being equal to one, some of the betas may be different than one or they may be greater than one. In particular, if there's significant adjustment costs, then you could get betas a lot greater than one. The market value of the firm uh, may uh, reflect the fact that a competitor could not instantly match you even if they bought the same IT. Um, you, know, you may have installed at great cost a new ERP system, as I mentioned before, um, that could have taken you years and a lot of um, person hours to do that. Someone else who buys the same hardware and software and it's sitting on their loading dock at their, um, at their company site um, would not have the same value. The computers on the loading dock are not worth nearly as much as they are once they're installed and integrated into an ERP system. In fact, they could be worth uh, five or 10 times as much once they're integrated. So that beta coefficient could be very large on IT or, or the other uh, coefficients for that matter. Um, and that's ultimately an empirical question. And um, we can get a sense of the total amount of um, digital capital by basically looking at the second equation that you see there, which is the value of uh, the digital capital is basically the IT value that can be measured directly multiplied by that coefficient that we estimate. And so the total uh, digital capital may be, as I said, uh, you know, 10 times as great as the hardware itself. Now, in theory, that should be straightforward. In practice, it's been very difficult to get a, a reliable IT investment series. Um, and so what we've done is we've used IT labor from LinkedIn. You guys all are familiar with LinkedIn. You probably have your resumes on LinkedIn as to uh, millions of other people. And those resumes tell you something about what kinds of jobs people have, what kinds of skills they have, how many people work in IT or work as uh, managers in different companies. Um, we can roll those up to the, uh, aggregate them up to the to individual firms. And now we have some insight into what those firms are doing. And um, we can go back quite far in history. We can actually buy, because resumes, my resume lists stuff going back into the, well, I won't say how long going back, but going back to the, to the 90s and 80s. 
And so um, we can get some sense of, um, of the skills and uh, types of people who were employed at firms even before LinkedIn was started. Um, and we convert the IT headcounts into dollars by looking at the typical wages of people in that job and multiplied by the number of people in that job in that particular firm. So this is gonna be somewhat noisy, but it gives us some estimate. Uh, here's a, a random uh, LinkedIn profile that we picked up uh, from, from a guy named uh, Sunny Tambay. And uh, you can uh, take that, as I mentioned, and get some sense of how much education they have, what their occupation is, and uh, roll them up to different firms. Some of them are in one firm and some of them are in different firms and basically create um, uh, hundreds of millions of, of employer employee combinations that gives us these longitudinal measures. The metrics are actually quite consistent with what you get from uh, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics or other data sources. So we feel fairly confident we're getting something useful. It's been, we've been doing it as part of this economic graph project at LinkedIn. Um, there are some challenges and I've already hinted at some of them. Um, the sampling can be uneven. Um, there aren't a lot of uh, janitors on LinkedIn. There are a lot of software engineers, so you have to control for that. Um, some industries and regions um, have more or less coverage, but we can normalize that and it's not perfect, but we get some sense of, uh, of knowing that we only are covering um, you know, a, a smaller percentage in some occupations and a bigger percentage in other occupations. Um, even within occupations, there can be some bias. People who hop from one job to another frequently are more likely to keep their LinkedIn profile updated. Um, some people may lie on their LinkedIn profiles. Um, so there's going to be noise and we're, we're aware of that and we want to manage that and be, you know, we can discuss that further in the, in the discussion. But um, it is you know, incredibly detailed and fine-grained. It's uh, relatively up-to-date. And in some ways, it may be a better indication than the IT hardware that I used to use in a lot of my previous studies. I would measure the number of mainframes and com mini computers. But now with cloud systems, a lot of companies have outsourced um, a lot of the IT hardware, but they still have people on staff who have to work with the data. And so arguably the, the, the people they have working is a better indication of how IT intensive uh, they are. It also gets us, allows us to be very granular at looking at different categories, like how many people work in AI or cybersecurity or networks. And as we'll see, that also gives us a lot of indication of what's going on in the firms and how they differ. So with this data, and we can estimate that equation I showed you on the previous slide, and uh, you can get some answers there. So let's just look at the first column here, an ordinary least squares regression, where we are predicting the market value of a firm, the, the total value of all the equity and debt that that company, what it would cost to buy the company. And in this particular uh, regression table, I'm going to show you uh, a balanced panel analysis. And what you see is property, plant, and equipment has a coefficient of about 1.7. Now, if there were no adjustment costs, no intangibles, the coefficient should be equal to 1. So the fact that it's 1.7 tells us that, at least in this specification, there seem to be some intangibles or adjustment costs associated with it. Um, other assets, those are things like uh, accounts receivable, um, a uh, customer that promised to pay you and other things like that. They also have a coefficient that's close to one, but, but in this case, it's a little bit less than one. So I guess the market is not anticipating that you're necessarily gonna collect all of that or, or that maybe that managers will, will piss some of it away. So uh, they don't quite trust that that's all gonna uh, turn into value for the uh, stockholders. But the most interesting thing is these IT capital coefficient. In, in this specification, it's about 15. So every dollar of IT capital that you see on the balance sheet is associated with another $14 of intangibles for a total of 15. So there's a huge ratio there. Um, and that's consistent with what I was saying earlier, that there's some massive investments in business processes. Actually, let me just say one thing that this does not tell you. Um, it might be tempting to say that every time you buy a dollar of IT, your market value goes up by $15. It's not quite that because the reason it's going up is that you're also investing $14 in other assets. So it's not a free lunch that you can make, uh, you know, you can crank and, and, and get stockholder value that way. It's that um, we aren't observing the other $14 directly, but we are observing them indirectly by seeing this coefficient. And um, you can do other specifications um, using IT labor, like from the resume data. And the numbers bounce around a little bit, 
but generally they're in the neighborhood of, of you know, uh, eight to, to 10 or $16. Uh, so there's clearly a, a pretty high ratio of intangibles that are associated with IT, regardless of the particular specification. You know, you can use uh, median regressions, like the least absolute deviation. You can put in fixed effects and you get um, uh, numbers that are always quite a bit larger than one. Over time, you can see the pattern here. This is the value of these intangibles in the for the entire sample. And uh, you can see that in the early 90s, it was it was pretty low, it was barely measurable, then it shot up in the year 2000. And then it fell uh, towards the Great Recession. And since then, it's gone up a little bit. But this is includes both the price and the quantity. Now, this is where it gets interesting, we're going to separate out price from quantity. And uh, you have these two equations, the first one is, is pretty trivial. Uh, the value is just defined as price times quantity. So that's your first equation there on the left. The second equation is the adjustment cost equation. And it basically tells you that the quantity that you have today, the increase relative to the previous period is going to be proportional to how much higher the price is versus one. If the price is equal to one, there's no incentive to make additional investment. You're just getting no additional return. But if the price is greater than one, you have an incentive to make an investment in that. And, uh, but you can't do it instantaneously. So the alpha coefficient in front of that tells you how easy or how quickly you can, uh, you can make that investment. And uh, so over time, um, that's going to lead to more investment when uh, P is greater than one. So now we have two equations and two unknowns. I find it easier to see it graphically. Uh, the uh, the magenta line there, P equals VQ, I've just rewritten the equation I showed you before. Um, that's a hyperbola that uh, tells you the relationship between uh, price and quantity. Um, and the other equation is a marginal adjustment curve. And, and I, I plotted one particular one there. And where the two lines intersect, that's the equilibrium that tells you the quantity of capital and the price of capital that you have for that particular firm. So those are the two equations and two unknowns. Now let's go ahead and implement this. Uh, the, the graph on the far left is the same one I showed you earlier, um, where you see that the, the price, the, the, the value went up in, in the year 2000, then it fell, and then it went back up again. Now we break that into the two components. The price of digital capital was actually fairly close to one during most of this period, but it peaked, it, it doubled around the year 2000 in the dot-com boom. Um, and then that implies that the uh, quantity of digital capital grew steadily. It, it fell a bit um, just after the year 2000, but it's now at an all time high. So the, that far right chart is especially interesting because that tells you the quantity of these uh, intangible assets in the firms. Now I did make some assumptions in order to calculate this and let me go and see how robust it is to those assumptions. Uh, the first assumption was we had to we don't we don't know exactly what the speed of adjustment is so we had to guesstimate and, and we put in a, a, a estimate of three for that for the for the alpha adjustment cost parameter um interestingly it, it's fairly robust bob hall predicted it would be robust to this and he was right he's a pretty smart guy so um if you plug in 1.5 or uh, 6.0 you get these different lines um that are slightly different in terms of the quantities, but qualitatively, they're very similar. So it, it's really not that uh, sensitive to what you choose as the adjustment cost parameter, at least within that, that range. The other assumption we had to make to get things started is we had to have some starting capital. And after that, you can do it iteratively or recursively. Um, and I was, it's interesting to see it has almost no effect on uh, what you start as a capital. You can set the initial capital equal to zero, or you can set it equal to uh, uh, the, uh, a full amount of the property, plant, and equipment in, in the beginning period in, I guess, 1987 or 1982, I think. Um, um, regardless of what you pick, it very quickly it converges, and uh, you see that uh, the pattern is not sensitive at all to it. So the good news is that, you know, you have to do have to pick a value for alpha and, and k naught, the initial period, but um, it doesn't really matter too much within reason uh, what values you pick. You're still going to get a, a pattern very similar to what I showed you. Now it's worth comparing the intangibles to the physical capital. So uh, ITIC is another name for uh, digital capital. I have to update this slide, but IT, that's IT related intangible capital, AKA digital capital. 
And uh, what you see is it went from almost insignificant uh, before 1990 to growing over time, as I showed you, especially to the dot com, but now even more. And um, compared to property, plant, and equipment, it's now about 20 or 25 percent of the total. So while property, plant, and equipment is well measured in our national accounts and on balance sheets of most companies, these intangibles have not been measured and they're now getting to be a, a pretty significant share of it. Furthermore, you can now do it at within firms, and this is pretty interesting, I think. Um, most of the digital capital has been created in the top 10% of firms. Uh, each of these different colored lines is a different decile of the firms. And uh, the top 10% there you can see is, is really soaring. The next 10% also is growing a fair amount, um, but the bottom 80%, um, they've really barely moved since the year 2000. So they've been relatively flat. We're seeing a few firms pulling away from the rest. This particular chart I'm showing you is a balanced panel. So this does not include you know, Google and Facebook and some of the other, Tesla, some of the famous uh, firms that have you know, enormous trillion dollar digital capital and uh, intangible capital and, and market value uh, uh, estimates. Um, so this is just a balanced panel of firms that have been around since the beginning of the period. And even within those industries, um, you see that the top percent, percent of firms are pulling away. If we included those uh, other digital firms, the effect would be even larger. Now let's go to production functions. So what you can do is you can take this digital capital uh, that we have now estimated and just plug it right in, the quantity of digital capital and plug it in to firm level um, equations and get an estimate of the um, uh, output elasticity, how much additional sales is created. And so the first column there um, basically uh, is there a traditional production function like I've written run a hundred times and many other people have? Um, uh, non IT capital is about twenty six percent counts for about twenty six percent of output. Labor about you know sixty five or sixty six percent. IT capital about four or five percent. Um, so we've seen those kinds of equations before. Now if we plug in IT capital, that accounts for an additional four percent. So we're explaining some of the residual. And uh, the coefficient on IT drops a little bit, you can see there, because it's picking up some of that, but it's some on top of that. It's not simply just reallocating. There's some additional explanation going on there. And even when you put in fixed effects, you get pretty large and significant effects. In fact, the IT capital, uh, the, the digital capital coefficient is larger than the IT capital uh, coefficient. So we're now finding another factor of production that previously wasn't measured and can predict future output and future productivity firms that have more IT intangible capital or more digital capital are able to create more output than uh, otherwise identical firms that have the same capital labor and IT capital, but they don't have as much digital capital. So this is a, 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 a good way of predicting which firms will be more productive in the coming years. Now, overall, what's gonna happen in the economy, and let me, let me just uh, make a last couple of points here. The um, Earlier, I said that this is going to have an effect on total factor productivity. Is it going to be underestimated or overestimated? So think a bit about that. Are we going to, because we've been mismeasuring or not measuring digital capital for all these years, and, and I just made the case that it's actually a very large percentage of total capital, um, is that, how's that going to affect things? Well, the answer is that it depends. Total factor productivity is going to be underestimated to the extent that intangible inputs are used to build up intangible stock. So during the investment period, while we're creating these intangibles, we are creating some unmeasured output. We're creating, you know, we're building factories, um, but these factories are invisible. They're made out of uh, business processes instead of made out of bricks and mortar. So these factories are very productive, but we aren't counting them, which is that we don't really see them. And if we were measuring this, we would see that there's more output being created by the economy than what we've been counting. So that means we're underestimating TFP. We're creating a valuable output that isn't being counted. The numerator is mismeasured. Um, however, in other situations, TFP is going to be overestimated to the extent that these intangible assets already exist. Once you've created them and you start using them and harvesting them to create output, now it's the other way around. Now we have an unmeasured denominator, an unmeasured input that is being used to create value. And it's as if this value is just coming magically out of thin air. 
but in reality, it's not coming out of thin air. It's coming out of these in, intangible assets. So then we would overestimate TFP by not counting the denominator correctly. Um, so those two effects will depend on whether or not we're mostly accumulating intangible assets or mostly using previously created intangible assets. In the long run, these two effects could exactly offset if we're, if we're adding to intangible capital at the exact same rate that we're using it, um, and then we would get zero mismeasurement. Um, and the market prices are gonna re re reflect that. So to be a little bit more formal. Um, and sorry, Eric, I still yeah. have like one more minute. Okay, one, one more minute. More. Let, me, let me just uh, map this into a, a productivity equation then. And um, so the portion on the left here is the traditional Bob Solo uh, production function uh, of economic growth, uh, that the output of the economy is a function of the changes in capital times the return on capital times the changes in labor. I used N here, I should have used L um, for them to return on labor. But there's these new terms here uh, the lambda that I showed you earlier is that coefficient. And when that lambda is greater than um, Z or greater than one, the ratio is greater than one, um, then we're going to have some unmeasured contributions from this. So these additional terms tell you how much you're mismeasuring output. And I won't go into it in detail, but it's described uh, further in the paper and especially in my paper with Daniel Rock and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Chad Severson. Um, here's the actual total amount of mismeasurement. The, graphically, it generates this J curve um, where initially you underestimate and then you overestimate um, productivity growth. I believe we're at kind of near the bottom or the early middle of the, uh, the J curve. So I, I predict that productivity is gonna grow in the coming years. Uh, we'll see if that's true. Um, in the LinkedIn data, we can map this to different kinds of AI skills, um, which we can talk about during the discussion if we'd like. And uh, let me skip this uh, productivity scenario that basically gives you some intuition for how big it should be and wrap up by saying, uh, let me just give you the, the, the bottom line here. We can measure the value of intangibles associated with IT, which we call digital capital. Um, most of the fluctuations in recent years, especially have been due to changes in quantities, accounts for about 20 to 25% of the total. It's mostly concentrated in a few superstar firms, the top 10%. And they seem to be pulling away further and further. So we're not having the, the skills and processes uh, learned more widely. Instead, they're getting more concentrated. Um, when you take that intangible and plug it into a productivity equation, you get about double the total uh, contribution of IT capital. It's, um, it's a huge contribution that hasn't been measured previously. Um, although, and I, I didn't show this yet, but um, the, uh, the AI portion is not yet adding if you just pull that out. Um, the effects are, uh, you can do that at the firm level, but you can also aggregate it up to the macro economy and it's uh, qualitatively quite large. Um, and it creates what we call this productivity J curve where you invest in the intangibles at first and then later you harvest them. So the paper's available uh, on my website. You can read about it there. And uh, I look forward to your comments and discussion. Thanks very much. And uh, great. Thanks so much, Eric. And uh, Miao, would you like to share your slides? We still don't see your slides. Meanwhile, I'm happy to take a question or anything if, if while uh, Meow gets the slides ready. Or if you have, um, I mean, I have five million questions, but I I'm gonna wait. I can ask you later. And there's still no questions on um, Q and A, and uh, I'll take this chance to rem remind people. Okay, to there we go. On Q and A. Okay, excellent. Okay, Meow, Sorry. please go ahead. Somehow, yeah, somehow my uh, my Zoom crashed. That's a really unexpected. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Will, and everybody for uh, having me here. This is a very ambitious paper, I have to say, uh, which follows, um, obviously, Eric's uh, long line of impactful research. Now, uh, let me give you a quick summary of the uh, paper before we, uh, we dive into some detailed comments. So, um, let me move on. All right, so the paper 
um, by and large, is creating a very innovative measure of the quantity of a firm's digital capital. And if you think about this, I mean, how do you get to this measure? And it's going to be very um, tricky business. And the, as we can see, Eric went through three steps of marrying uh, this quantity. So first of all, how should we proxy for firms' digital investment, right? Which is not obviously not a, uh, available on the you know CompuStat data, for example. And going from there, how should we measure the market value of firms' digital capital? That has already been a very um, tricky discussion in the finance literature, um, at least when you think about how to decompose a firm's market value. And here we have to encounter this hurdle. And finally, how do you separate the quantity and the price of a firm's digital capital? So as you can see, these are all very challenging hurdles. And what's amazing about this paper is that Eric and co-authors are going through the, uh, the, the hurdles and try to accomplish this final measure, which is this Q, the quantity of the firm's digital capital. And once they have this measure, the paper opens a whole, like a whole foods of results. Um, so I, I won't be able to um, go over all of them. So let me pick a couple. So we see that, for example, the rising value of digital capital after two, 2001 is mainly because of quantity, not so much about price. And very interestingly, we see that the digital capital is concentrated in a small group of superstar firms. And this is a, absolutely, absolutely speaking to uh, this recent topic about increasing concentration, uh, the declining business dynamism. I have a lot to say about this part here in my comments. And finally, uh, um, uh, they sh show that uh, digital capital helps improve firms' productivity. So without diving into details of how they did it. Um, let me just say that the, Eric used a very innovative data of LinkedIn to measure the digital investment and use Bob Hall's um, quantity revelation theory to get the price and quantity out of the uh, equation. So a general overview of contribution. I find there are really so many out of, uh, results here. And uh, uh, let me just pick one, which I it really is my favorite uh, uh, area of research, and I think this paper can really speaks to, is the explanation of the rising superstar firms. As of now, if you're following this literature, we know that there has been already raised several explanations for why the U.S. economy are seeing the rising and the rising superstar firms. And one of the promising explanation is that the superstar firms possess intangible capital, and the intangible capital may led to the increasing return to scale, which eventually created, make these firms to be disproportionately large. Now the problem for, for when you try to dig, dive into the intangible capital channel is that intangible capital is a catch-all phrase. It may reflect, for example, a greater brand value, which we can somehow link to market power, for example, or it may reflect the firm having more advanced know-how or technology. Now, when you think about policy making, we probably don't like too much market power, but we would embrace uh, technology. I mean, just for the sake of a long run economic growth. So obviously there is a huge need to dive into the detail, open up the hood of what is under, what is, what is under the hood of a super uh, star firm's intangible capital. And rather, without, rather than, uh, you know, blah, blah, I will, let me just, quote John Van Rienen's comments in the 2020 Declining Dynamism Conference, he mentioned about the intangible capital. He mentioned that measures we have are very crude. Better to use more firm level measures, such as using administrative data for specific types of intangibles. And apparently, as you can see, this paper is gonna shed direct light on this literature, which I'm very excited about. Okay, so, a quick outline of my discussion. I will be very much focusing on the implication of digital capital on superstar firms. And then I'm gonna um, provide uh, one more, uh, I believe it could be an improvement to the empirical method. And lastly, I'll talk a little bit more about the LinkedIn data and the broadly the labor data we have uh, in this area. So let me, let's go about the first one. This to me, I think it's uh, was the graph really 
catches my eye when I was going through many, many interesting graphs of the paper. So let me describe this graph a little. Eric did a great job already. But um, so in this graph, uh, we are sorting firms based on their market value in 2016, which is the last year of their sample. And then we're looking backward, fixing this firm's ranking, we're looking backward to see how did the, let's say the largest firm became larger? How did the smaller firm remain smaller in terms of the quantity of their digital capital? In other words, what you see from here, this graph very obviously is that larger firms have accumulated historically accumulated a greater quantity of the digital capital, which I think is the inference of the paper so far, which I have, we have no problem about. Then the, the issue I'm trying to bring up here is that we know, first of all, the firm size distribution is extremely skilled in CompuStat firm, meaning larger firms, regardless of which measure you have, they are disproportionately larger than the rest of the firms. So the question, where that sort of comes back to me is that if I want to dive deeper into the inference of this graph, is this just a graph about these winners, these really big firms over time becoming bigger in every aspect rather than just digital capital? Or it's, it's, it's the, because they, just like Eric's example, disproportionately, you know, did not increase PPNE, but increased the digital capital. So what is the right inference and why does it matter? Well, first let's look at some um, other metrics of the uh, superstar firms. So here uh, I'm basically sort of replicating the graph uh, in Eric's paper, but I'm showing sort of different kinds of capital. I have PPNE, tangible capital from uh, Peter Z. Taylor, employment or sales. I mean, what you, I guess it's not um, difficult to conclude from this graph that you know if you do the same exercise tracking the history of the current winners, then apparently um, it looks like uh, you know the winners they are bigger in many fronts, not just the digital capital. That brings to the question that you know if I want to further infer that graph, is this a, just a scale effect? Bigger firms just getting bigger in every aspect or it's a composition effect. And I think that um, will, will be a very interesting point um, and to dive into. And not very surprisingly, Eric, of course, looked into that. And, the, and to me, I think this is uh, a money-making graph, um, at least to my appetite and the research. So what's really, really, really informative in this graph is that now we're gonna first scale each firm's uh, um, different capital. As you can see, A is the, on the right-hand side is the PPNE, and on the left-hand side is the digital capital. Let's first scale everything by employment. And still, what sh we show this stark in contrast that superstar firms accumulated disproportionately way more digital capital, but they kept their PPNE very low. So what's, what's so important about this graph? Well, the way I think about this is that it's a pointing to a need that John Van Rinen was calling for. That is, we see from here, superstar firms do seem to appear to possess a production technology that is way more tilted in digital capital, but not so much in PPNE and labor. So suddenly we see that the larger firms are not just you know, replicating small firms and becoming proportionately larger. However, instead, they are larger, you know, disproportionate. They have a better technology. And that we can, you know, build on this result and contribute to the superstar firm in the sense that we can talk more about whether digital capital eventually will lead to productivity or and can also lead to market power. But that's the next question. But I think this is leading us to the, a good way to there. Okay, my second comment is about uh, a measurement uh, process. So, so far in this paper, um, as I mentioned earlier, the paper goes through three steps and to create the measure. And the, one of the steps is that we need to have the market value of a firm that is only related to its digital capital. And that's a really difficult question if you think about it. And that's a question actually Bob Hall doesn't need to 
uh, encounter because in Hall's original paper, he's only looking at, he's using the total value of the market, market value to review the quantity of total capital. So we don't need to dive into this heter capital heterogeneity issue, but now we have to. And the current procedure of this paper goes through by, let's go through um, uh, OL's regression. So um, Eric already mentioned this regression. I'm not gonna elaborate more on that. And this regression is very solidly um, uh, uh, supported in theory, uh, simply because under the assumptions of Hall, especially under, under the constant return to scale of production function and adjustment costs, a firm market value actually can be decomposed linearly. That has been shown in a very interesting paper by Federico Bello and co-authors in the 2021 JFE paper. So if the firm's market value can be decomposed linearly in this equation here, then we can certainly run a regression. But what's missing, um, in the, I, would, I would argue, uh, from the regression is that when you run a rolling window regression, what's missing is that this, this, this theoretical equation essentially has a constraint. The constraint is that the three adjustment cost parameters, let's call it theta P, P, and E, that of other capital or that of IT. They have to be constant in order to identify the quantity and the, the, uh, the price of each capital. But when you run a regression, you know, there's no guarantee uh, this th uh, adjustment cost parameters, especially the theta of pp and e and that of other assets will be constant. And that would lead to um, a, 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 um, a difficult for us to uh, compare the capital of PPAE and capital IT, because it's unclear over time, let's say one goes up, the other didn't, is this because truly the quantity is changing or maybe the uh, adjustment cost parameter uh, is, uh, is changing over time. So if I, uh, I may, I would suggest that, you know, the authors to consider a structural approach to decompose the value of firm uh, following, for example, the Bellows paper, uh, rather than running a regression. And that, that I think could, um, could make, make the, um, sort of at least my concern to go away. And that would make this comparison of PP and E and, um, and the digital capital in the graph I showed earlier, much more convincing. So lastly, let me take um, maybe briefly uh, three, four minutes to uh, talk about the data side. This, this paper uses, it's enormously creative in my view. And, but also I think in, in the, you know, in the innovative, um, in a very intuitive way. So here's what I mean. The paper argues that investment in digital capital is not just about purchasing equipment like computers that work, you know, workstations, but also upgrading the firm's intangible side. And the latter could be you know, much, you know, many times costlier than the, the equipment side, which I absolutely agree. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I work on papers uh, looking at labor and capital side, and you can see that the adjustment coming that accompanied uh, with cap for capital upgrade is a lot coming from the labor and organization side. And then the paper certainly showcases the power of using the labor occupation data to measure a firm's digital capital. And the, you have to give credit to how carefully the authors went through the LinkedIn resume data to back out uh, a, a nice year firm occupation level data set. So ideally, we want to build a data set that I have the year, I have the firm, I have the occupation, and for each occupation in the firm, I know it's the number of employees and the wages. That's the goal, let's say. And Eric went through details, so I won't uh, elaborate more of how uh, they try to adjust and impute um, the LinkedIn data to be consistent with, with the OES data. So apparently the LinkedIn data covers disproportionately larger amount of high-skilled occupations, but not so much, other, so much others. And the LinkedIn data does not have wages. I guess to me, that's the two biggest hurdle there. So imputation is in general, it has been widely used. And a lot of times it just creates noise. That's not too much a problem for our analysis. What I'm trying to th think about is, you know, is it possible sometimes it can create uh, biases, and that's something we have to be very aware of. And here's what I come up with. Um, and of course, uh, we can entertain whether it's a big one or a small one. So for example, uh, it is likely that the payroll of 
IT employment is more directly proxy for the IT investment rather than the number of employees, which Eric, um, which is exactly sort of Eric did, it, right? You know, using employment, uh, but you know, multiplied by the wages, in, you know, broadly imputed, but not actual uh, the firm's occupation's wage. Now, the issue is that if larger firms pay higher wages, which is very well known in the labor economics called the firm size wage premium, then you're gonna see it that from the, the, the equation that the market value of digital capital will be underestimated for large firms, but overestimated for small firms. And the reason is that, you know, think about this. In actual, if you see the true data, the larger firm's wage is higher, but because we're imputing, so we're talking about every firm in the same occupation have the same wage. Then, you know, you're giving an underestimation of large firm's wage, and which uh, leading to the underestimation of the large firm's digital capital. Now, the, the nice thing I think is that, you know, if you can create that bias, that may lead to even greater difference in the digital capital quantity between small and large firms, because we're underestimating the digital capital quantity for large firms through this imputation. So that's just the one, uh, I think, improvement if we have even stronger data. And with that, I would like to introduce the BOS Occupational Employment and Wage Data. Uh, this is a data, um, I mean, personally speaking, I have been used in a lot of my research, and I, I think so could be a good addition. Um, I know Eric is uh, very open to multiple sources, other data sources, so let me talk briefly about this data, and I hope it can be somewhat helpful. Sorry, Miao, you have one minute, so. Perfect. Okay, so I'll just talk this slide, and I will be done. It's a government ad administrative panel data, has a long time series. And it reports the employment wages at a very detailed occupation level at the establishments. It covers 62% of US economy uh, employment and you know, millions of uh, establishments. In my previous paper, you know, this data can be matched to over you know, 3,000 uh, company set firms. So I do think this, uh, you know, in that sense, it's a really good complementary to LinkedIn. First of all, you have a stable coverage of firms over time. Uh, they didn't change the survey scale, so the scope over time. And all occupations within the establishment will be covered, so you don't need to do adjustment. And then finally, uh, they had wage data. So let me conclude. I think it is, as I said in the beginning, it's a really ambitious paper. The paper so far has a very innovative measure and a whole battery of really interesting findings. Uh, to me, I, I find the, 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 the implication on superstar firms is very promising. I hope my comments uh, will be helpful um, to everyone. Thank you. And thanks a lot, Miao. I just wanna remind everybody, if you have questions, please raise your hands and I will, uh, I will call on you to ask your questions. So while we are collecting questions from the Q&A and uh, raise hand, Eric, if you would like to, uh, uh, take a minute or two and uh, respond to what Mia raised. Sure. Well, first off, thanks very much. These are great comments. I've been taking notes on what you had to say. And uh, also, I know that uh, Sunny Tambe and Daniel Rock and Lauren Hitt are here as well, the co-authors on the paper, and they, they uh, are also in a position to answer some of the questions. Uh, we will certainly, um, I think your point about doing things per capita is, is spot on. It's very straightforward that we should uh, highlight that uh, more. Also, thanks for the, uh, the pointer to the new paper by uh, Bello, Frederico Bello and his, his co-authors. That's uh, going to be uh, very useful. So I, I think we'll be able to very uh, implement your, your suggestions in, in a straightforward way. Also, maybe broadening some of the data sets. At some point, that's going to be a different paper. But uh, I think uh, the, the first couple of suggestions are, will be real straightforward. I don't know whether Sonny or Daniel had anything you wanted to add to the discussion on that. Just to reiterate, so th thanks for uh, these. These are great comments, and um, I, I really, I really like that firm size wage premium suggestion. We do have some wage data uh, from LinkedIn, like you said. There's other sources we might be able to disentangle that a little bit, and I think that would be really interesting to explore as well. Yeah, the good news is I think all your suggestions are probably going to you know strengthen or confirm our results. So it's nice to to have that that cooperation.
Uh, great. So there was a question in the, uh, in the Q and A where uh, the Rox, uh, from Roxana Mihet, and she unfortunately doesn't have a mic, so I'm going to read it out to you. The question is: How do you think data regulations will impact the firm size distribution? Will superstar firms will be uh, will be hurt most? Will the smallest firms will be hurt most because they cannot um, uh, uh, because they cannot bear the costs of regulation and the superstar firms will end up being even larger? Well, of course, it's going to depend on the nature of the regulation, but uh, the, many of the regulations that have been put in place recently have had exactly the effect that was suggested by the, the second part of the question. Uh, for instance, the uh, GDPR. Um, I was initially a little surprised at, at how uh, Facebook and Google seemed very happy to have those uh, regulations implemented. And then I thought a little bit more and saw how they were playing out. And it was exactly what you said, that, that it turned out that they were able to manage it much more easily than smaller firms. And if anything, it became an additional barrier to entry. Um, so um, right now, Facebook is saying they're welcoming more regulation. And uh, I think uh, maybe if I reveal preference, uh, it's not going to be such a bad thing for them if it's implemented the way it has in the past. That said, I don't think it's hard to imagine an alternative set of regulations, you know, like antitrust um, or uh, Paul Romer has an idea for a, a tax on the size of firms that um, obviously mechanically would, would hurt bigger firms the way he has it set up relative to smaller firms. So you could do it different ways, but, but de facto it, it's, um, it seems to have been reinforcing the effects that we saw in the paper of bigger firms pulling away from smaller firms. Um, okay, great. Um, uh, so Will has the next question. Um, so Will, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. I uh, really enjoyed the presentation and, and the discussion as well. My question is, uh, you know, when we think about these superstar firms, uh, I mean, overall, we do observe a trend of, you know, firms, uh, going from producing standalone products uh, into building an ecosystem being, you know, uh, uh, a supplier for many other even competing, uh, uh, com competing firms. Um, so, so if we think about that, uh, do, you, um, do you think it's important to make a distinction of superstar firms that, you know, grow large in their digital capital, in their data, um, but they are also transforming themselves into more of a, you know, uh, power connector mode node in the, in the network, mm -hmm. uh, intermediary yeah. role maybe. Um, well, I think the point you made, or that, that, um, that Mia made um, earlier um, about how the, the ratio is changing between the um, yeah. uh, assets is, is important. We something we should bring out more in the paper. Um, there's a paper that, uh, uh, Andy McAfee and I wrote a, a while back called uh, Scale Without Mass that basically made the case a little bit along the lines of what you're saying that, that there are more and more firms that were using digital assets and business processes, not just in the, you know, the software and internet world, but in other, you know, in retailing and manufacturing to become much more digitally enabled and, and connecting um, uh, different companies in platforms, right. creating value that way, often relatively light on physical assets themselves. Um, you know, you think of uh, like an Airbnb or an Uber um, and uh, creating a, a lot of value, or at least capturing a lot of value from, from, from doing that. So you can, you can see that that would become more and more important over time. And I think there's some evidence of, of exactly that happening. Thank you. Um, okay, great. I think uh, also given that Eric is very busy and he has a tight schedule, uh, our official time is unfortunately over. So I would like to thank everybody who joined us today. And of course, more than anybody, Eric and Miao. So please uh, uh, join us for giving them a virtual round of applause. And thank you very much for inviting me. I got, we gained a great deal from these, uh, especially Miao's comments, but from all the discussion, thanks for giving us a chance to, to share some of this work. Uh, Thank you for having me. Uh, you're both more than welcome. Uh, so we hope that everybody has enjoyed the discussion today and we look forward to seeing you all next month with Jared uh, Hoberg and David Robinson discussing scope, scale and competition, the 21st century firm. So now we're going to stop the recording
but we hope that you can uh, stay for uh, about 15 min more minutes uh, uh, to join us for a post seminar discussion when we can all ask a follow up question from Eric and Miao. And we're going to upgrade all the remaining participants to a panelist status so that we can all see each other and have a nice chat. So to everybody who joined us, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thanks so much for coming. And we, I wish you a very, very nice day. Thank you.